Okay, uh, let's have a class. So uh, I'm starting to add the grade into the exam one, but it will be took some time because I'm double check. And I will stop there because uh, one of you guys didn't write the name very clearly, and I asked another faculty to help. So that's why I laid a little bit. So make sure next time you have your, um, the name, first name, last name is all right very well. Okay. So we're going to move on to exam two, uh, lecture one. In the exam two, most of the time we will talk about is the bacteria caused the infectious disease. Bacteria caused infectious disease. And these are very common disease, which is recognized by the United States CDC, and. Uh, it's a very common those bacteria cause disease. We're going to go over these one by one. The characteristics, the symptoms, and the some story behind that. And then we will talk about antibiotics. And then we will talk about the control of the bacteria pathogen used as a methods. So pretty much is bacteria cause infectious disease and the control the pathogen. You can understand about that. So the first section what we're going to talk about is the bacteria in the respiratory tract disease. And this is a little bit of anatomy, which is we talk about the respiratory tract. I'm going to go over all these things in detail because it's not a anatomy class, but we want to mention something. First of all, there is a tonsil area. The tonsil area we will mention, this is a very good reservoir of bacteria. So that's the reason lots of the tonsil is taken out when you were young. That's a very good places for the pathogen and for the bacteria to survive there. And sometimes even a normal bacteria, when the condition changes, let's say the weather becomes uh, hot, suddenly becomes warm, then become cold, or the vice versa, these bacteria could be translocated. And once they translocated, they could cause a problem. Uh, OC, uh, OCAT. Translocated, they will cause a problem. We call it opportunistic bacteria, which means the bacteria looking for the opportunity to cause a problem. And uh, we also want to say is that epigolitis, this structure is usually to separate the upper respiratory tract and the lower respiratory tr tract. And there's an esophagus, which is right here, according to, uh, uh, basically is around here, there is a soft bone. So that's why uh, when you are eating, it should be closed, and when you're talking, it's open. So that's why you, when you were young, your parents or your kindergarten teacher will tell you, do not talk when you're eating. Otherwise, the foods will could be go to the esophagus, okay? Or, or, or so sorry. Or other, other, otherwise, the foods will go to the lung area because that's a soft that's a soft bone will be open and closed all the time. Now back down here, you will see the lung area, there the alveolia and the bronchi and all these places. Some of the disease like ammonia will be attacking there. So those are target location for some of the streptococcus. Staphylococcus, or those could be the location. Okay, so these are the basically the respiratory tract. And we will folks talk about the respiratory tract at the beginning. This is the outline of we will talk about basically in the first couple of um, couple of lectures. So diphtheria, we're gonna talk about the corner bacteria diphtheria real quick. Um, there's a pathogen called the voluntary pertussis, will cause whooping cough, we'll talk about real quick. Then ammonia has so many, we have a streptococcus ammonia, staphylococcus, legionella, microplasma, clamcella, and the pneumocytosis. All these will cause ammonia, but some of them cause the ammonia is like very mild symptoms. For example, microplasma ammonia. Um, this is the pathogen which is uh, usually caused walking ammonia. We will be have the cough or sneezing a couple of days, but it will be recovery naturally by itself. Streptococcus, 
infection, we will call, talk about streptococcus pyogenes, will cause strep throat, and it's a very invasive bacteria. Then today we will talk about the meningitis, which is called by Haemophilus influenza, Neisseria meningitis, streptococcus pneumoniae. It's age dependent. And last one we already talked about is microbacterial tuberculosis, called tuberculosis. So this is basically is a study guideline for you, the disease and the cause of microorganism and the characteristics of microorganism you need to remember and you need to know. At the beginning, I want to mention briefly about this guy, which is Legionella ammonia. Uh, Legionella ammonia, where it caused? This is the name coming from 1970s in Philadelphia. There is an army convention. And after the army convention, everybody taking a shower. Then after shower, in the second day, people start to show ammonia symptoms. And it caused most likely is from the passages survived in the showering water system. So usually the drinking water system, or like the shower water system, air conditioning system, people have to do a routine testing of Legionella because that's a passion usually survive in those plumbing areas. Okay, so very briefly, but it will it not cause a big problem, uh, although CDC listed as a passenger, but its uh, symptoms is mild, is not, the death rate is very low. Okay, so these are very briefly, we talk about overall. Next, we're going to go detail. The first bacteria we want to talk about is Cardiobacteria dipseria. So I will remove, I'll be started right here. Okay, so... Corner bacteria dipseria. Corner bacteria dipseria. Okay. Corner bacteria, you know this is a genome name. Dipseria is a species name. Where this comes from? Corner in the Greek word, which means club. So this comes out with the first question. What are the three major items after the gram stain we should always keep recording? is gram reaction, cell morphology, and arrangement. So the first characteristic of cornobacterial dipseria, this is gram positive, lots, morphology, and arrangement is club shape. And what it looks like, it could be two of them like this, like a two piece of banana. It could be like this, stack together like you go to the nightclub. <laughs> or it could be like this. People say it's like a Chinese characteristic too. Okay, so there's a different arrangement, but it's all like stacked together like a club. Sometimes in the right in the middle, you see these dots there, and this is what we call the inclusion, and that is uh, is the area which is for storage of phosphates, for example. Some of the chemicals can be stored there. So this is a very important, the first characteristics. The second thing we want to move on to, and the, uh, sorry, this is a slide. You can see it, what it looks like. And these type of thing we also call the palisades. The second question is, what are going to be the symptoms of this guy? Okay, we want to mention something here. This is most likely is for less than five year old kids or more than 60 year old older people. But very typical in the United States, less than five year old kids is a risk group, especially the immigrant kids. This is not for discrimination. This is basically is on a, uh, in the CDC recording the infectious disease survey. So very easy. Give you an example. If you have a five-year-old immigrant kids, 
But one day he's crying, and wah, 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 then, the, then the mother takes him to see the doctor. And the doctor said, please open your eyes. So let's do, let me draw this, okay. Let's say open your eyes, and the kid is, is open the eyes, okay. What happened when they opened the eyes? Uh, open the mouth, say ah, let's say we're going to say ah. You will see this tonsil area. has a very, very typical, it's a soft, heavy, bleeding, seedal membrane. It's not really a membrane, but it looks like a seedal membrane. If you use cotton swab to touch, it is soft, it is bleeding. This is a typical symptom for called a bacterial dipsaria. And what else you will see? You will see the neck is swelling. So the swelling neck looks like a ball. So we call it a ball neck. Now why there is the swelling of the neck? Because of the lymph nodes is like swelling. These are very two typical symptoms for immigrant kids less than five years old. Now, why we want to say this? Because in the United States, the CDC requires there is an immune plan for the kids after born and go to become adults. And there is a vaccine can control this passage very well, which is DTAP. If you go back to see your childhood immune recording from your pediatrician, you definitely will see you did this when you were young. What is the D? Cornobacteria diphtheria. What is T? Clostridium tetanus. <clears throat> what is P? Bordetera pertussis. And what is A? This is not much meaning. A cellular. So this is one shot. Three drugs. One dose, you can control three passages. In the United States, it is required to do that. So that's why in the United States, a natural born United States citizen, this is not a big problem. But for the immigrant kids, lots of people from South America or some from other countries, they did not have that immune system. So if the parents did not do that, it's very easy we'll have the corner bacterial dip dipsaria. Okay? And another thing I also want to mention, this is not a one shot in your lifetime. This is, you need to have a booster. The boosters needs to be due period of time. I believe it's gonna be two months, four months, six months, and a year or beyond. Because the reason is, this vaccine is a toxoil. The toxoil of the vaccine, which is, means it is a toxic-like chemical. And this is chemical is only going to be activate your T cell line. And your B cell line is not going to be activated, not for B cell line. Because of that, they will be generated not a really antibody, it's only a universal defense system. And that memory capability in your body is not very long, not very strong. So you need to do a lot of the booster shots during uh, the lifetime. And you can see your immune record. It's absolutely it's doing something, OK? Now, the question is, where this one comes from? Now, of course, it's going to be transferred through the airborne. When you're in the daycare, and they, they touch everywhere, and the people are in a very crowded area, it could be transferred. Now, we want to talk about this toxin. Okay, diphtheria toxin, what is that? 
Look at here. This is very, very typical. Dipseria toxin. We want to talk something right here is this pathogen is in the tonsil area, is localized. So, which means this bacteria is not going to transfer. It's always going to stay in the local area. However, this toxin, this dipseria toxin, dipseria toxin is transferred, is invasive. And this pathogen, we also call it is an exotoxin. And this toxin a very characteristics. It is called an AB toxin. And for every AB toxin, there is a two domain. Domain, which means an area of the protein, kind of like an area of the protein, which is a multiple molecular grab together, and they have the specific biological function. And A domain. We call it a toxin domain. Toxin domain obviously has a toxin in the B domain, which is a transmembrane domain. And the transmembrane domain usually causes bleeding. Will cause bleeding. That's why you see the pseudo membrane is will be caused bleeding. And where is this toxin comes from? How they work? This toxin a long time ago coming from a bacterial forage called a beta forage. And they think about a long time ago, a bacteria called a common bacteria, they eat a bacterial forage, and the forage is integrated the DNA sequencing into the chromosome of this bacteria. And later on they stay there forever, kind of like a parasites go to the host. And they stay there for a very, very long time, and this beta phage become a toxin. It has become exotoxin, it's a dipseria toxin. And we have a terminology to describe it, it's called lysogeny conversion. Okay, now what is the, really the principle behind this toxin? This toxin into your body will generate an endosome. And the endosome will be in a very acid environment. So pH is low, pH is about like five. Then the AB toxin will be separate, their domain. The A domain will release, B domain and will release. The toxin domain basically will be prevent the host cell DNA replication. And also will be prevent the DNA transcription. And related to the translation, because it will be prevent or stop elongation factor two. Okay, so at the end of the day, it's gonna be attacking your DNA system. So the genomic system will cause a problem. So we talk about the here, Talk about these symptoms, talk about these things. Then what we gotta do the treatments? The treatment you always remember because it is a CDC record in the passages. So always the number one for the prevention is the vaccine. And always remember the vaccine is the best way to prevent all the infectious disease, regardless of bacteria or virus. The second, because there is an exotoxin called a dipseria toxin, you have to use anti-toxic, to toxicant. You must use those things. And of course, it is a bacteria, you have to use antibiotics. So these are the three will be the combination to do it. Let's look at the slides, what we have so far. This slide, which is underneath phase contrast microscope, it is clearly tells you what is called bacterial dipseria looks like. Palisites, club shape, you can see. They even can stack like up and down, okay? But typically looks like that, it's a club shape. Gram-positive, large. 
Um, this is this is the one most of the time is inhibit protein synthesis, but the related DNA replication transcription translation target is elongation factor too. It's a resistant to the drying envir environments. Air bond transmission by nasal for gel solutions. Diphtheria, what it looks like. Cedo membrane in the tonsil area looks like that. And you see the swelling here is bald neck. So that's a lymphonoid is swelling. Heavy neck, that's not very good. Then I said it is localized in the tonsil area, but the exotoxin could go different parts of your organs. It could be damaged neural system, heart and kidney, could go everywhere. And we have to use antitoxin, neutralize the exotoxin, do antibiotic therapy. But do not forget about, you need to do the vaccine. The DTAP vaccine is very important. Now the people are going to ask me, how are we going to do the culture? Is this one we can do a cult culturalization? Yes, of course, we can do the culture. This is a bacteria you need to be doing, first of all, identify. Is all a very selective media <coughs> called cysteine pterorite blood agar. <coughs> On the terrorized blood agar, it is black colony because this is caused by reducing salt. Now, once you get the isolation, let's say you use a tonsil from here, you do the gram stain, you find this gram positive, large, club shape. Then you strip plenty on the system, terrorize the blood agar, you see the black colony. Then you need to go to a transport media. So what is a transport media? These are the media you usually later on have to ship into the CDC lab. So go to the CDC lab to do a final confirmation and record keeping. This transport media is called Leo Furrow Transport Media. So that's something I want to mention, the bacterial culture. And this is the one from the CDC website. It is up to 2012. This is a recommended childhood and adolescent immunization skill. On the top, you can see it's very clearly at 15, 18 months, recommend false DTAP shots. If you see here, what D represents diphtheria, T tetanus, P pertussis, you're required to do 2, 4, 6, 18, 15, and 4 and 6 years old. So lots of the boosters. And the reason we already said, because it's only activated T cell line. Remember the immune system, you have two lines, which is B cell line and T cell line. This is only activated T cell line. So the memory <coughs> capability is not strong, and there is no antibody. And this is the immune system which is actually required to do. Otherwise, you can go to school and daycare, in public school and public daycare, even private school, because they want you to be having that immune record when you go to the other first day. Okay, because that can be protect yourself and also the others. And this slide, which tells you briefly what it happened. So look at here, this is a typical AB toxin. The so AB toxin, when they come in, there's two domains, A and B, they become an endosome. This endosome is pH about 5.0. A is a toxin domain. The toxin domain here is prevent the, uh, the DNA the translate, tra transcription and translation, which is target is elongation factor 2. Now, of course, a little bit for the NAB, nicotinic adenine dinucleotides. It's an electron tra transfer carrier. And then the B domain will release and go ahead to transmembrane to find another A then shipping inside. So the B domain usually work a lot in the cell membrane system will cause bleeding. That's why the B domain is a cause of bleeding. So that is a very good. 
uh, the mode of action called the diphtheria toxin, which is explained about that. So here is the first example of the bacteria infectious disease. What you need to know is the characteristics, the target group, and what type of the symptoms we'll be causing, a little bit about the mechanism and how we're going to do the treatments. And those, you probably need to have some flash card, and we also will have a, a case study for you to understand it when we do the review. Because exam two, we'll have lots of case study. It will be a little bit difficult than exam one. Uh, we have lots of case study. We'll put the passage in a real scenario to let you figure out which bacteria it is. Because lots of you in the future will go to a medical school, dental school, or public health school, and these are the basic knowledge will help you to understand. Okay. So this is the first one, which is called a bacterial diphtheria. Uh, diphtheria. Then the second part, we're going to move on to a major bacteria caused the disease, which is called meningitis. And there is a lot so we can talk. Uh, we will pick one of a typical colony of bacteria and talk a little bit more details. And something else, we will be just uh, uh, briefly mention, mention about that. Okay, so let's wipe off the blackboard and have more space that we can talk about all these details. So, first of all, meningitis. What is meningitis? Mini. Meningitis, say the very simple. This is the inflammation in brain membrane or between brain membrane and cerebral, cerebral spinal. Freud, CSF, cerebral spinal Freud. So what is the inflammation usually will cause? Very typical symptom for the inflammation, usually it is heat, it is red area, it is a little bit of swearing, and of course you are feeling hurt. Okay. Now, for the meningitis, what are the typical symptoms? Of course, you have a headache. You are feeling less allergy. Sometimes you may be scared to light. So we call it a photophobia. And sometimes, don't forget another very typical symptom is tough neck. This is typically happens in undergraduates in the, uni in the, in the university, the tough neck. Lots of people don't realize that. See, think that the tough neck, maybe we are just a muscle. So you take a break, so you sleep a longer time, and second day you'll find you're still not very well. At the same time, you need to see whether it is meningitis because we want to mention there's one pathogen which has caused meningitis very severely among undergraduates. So first of all, meningitis is age-dependent. Uh, which means a pathogen could be targeted for certain age group of people. If you are in two to two months, zero for two to two months, which is newborn baby, the target pathogen caused meningitis is group B streptococcus agalactia. The acronym called GBS. It is called group B streptococcus agalactia. We will mention this later on. If you two months to five years old, the young kids, the risk group is type B, hemophilus influenza. If you're adults, five year old to 40 year old, including 
Well, you guys, I'm a 41, I'm a little bit older than this, so this is Neisseria meningitis. How about the older people, if more than 40 years old, in medical, more than 40 years old, we call it old people. Streptococcus pneumonia. So, there are the different risk groups. We will talk about the Nicaera meningitis uh, real quick. Streptococcus pneumonia, talk about next week. Uh, Streptococcus agalactia, we'll be talking about next week when we talk about Streptococcus. So, we want to talk about this guy first. He's a Haemophilus influenza. Okay. Haemophilus influenza is a very bad stuff. How bad it is? This is number one, childhood, childhood disease in the United States. History. Right now, we had a vaccine, HIV vaccine. So it's called solve the problem. How they make the vaccine is from the capsule. They get the capsule from the hemophilus influenza, they make the vaccine. Hemophilus influenza, it is a fastidious bacteria. Which means this bacteria is not to grow on three major, on two major clinical isolated agar. We talk about in the clinical area, there is a three major agar. Is Makangi agar. Uh, by the way, we're going to do this in the lab real quick, okay? Makangi agar. Blood agar. And chocolate agar. This is a fastidious bacteria, which means it's very picky. It's a picky one. So the joke I always tell you, think about your girlfriend sometimes, it's very picky, fastidious bacteria. But sometimes the boys is also picky, is that right? So think about your lovely relation. That's a picky bacteria, the same thing. Makaki it didn't grow. Blood agar, it didn't grow. Then it will only grow on chocolate agar. And we say the chocolate agar is blood agar you heat it at 70 degrees Celsius, and turning brownish. Looks like a chocolate. So we say it's a chocolate like agar. Then people take out the like to so become chocolate agar. So it's only grown the chocolate agar. And another thing is that this is a gross condition, it's a very picky condition. They need a two factor to grow, X and V factor. X factor is hemi, and the V factor is NAD, nicotinating adenine dinucleotides. So people do a research. If in other plates, I have a hemi there, I have a NAD, the bacteria didn't grow. If I have ingredients, a piece of strip, I put X and V together, we find this bacteria grow really good. And they need these two factors to grow. So we call it a need X and V factor to grow. So the grow rely on X, V factors. And the people also find it very interesting. In the clinical area, if I have a blood agar, and on the blood agar, I'm going to grow in a Staphylococcus aureus. This is a Staphylococcus aureus. What they find, they find this bacteria grow very tiny colony. Surrounded the Staphylococcus aureus. So we call it a satellite phenomenon. Because it looks like the satellite does surround the Staphylococcus aureus. The reason is on the blood agar, naturally you have a hemi. That's X factor. 
And when the bacteria, the Staphylococcus aureus, grow the blood agar, it will degenerate the V factor, which is NAD. So it creates a very comfortable environment for this bacteria to grow. That's why it has a satellite phenomenon. It's very interesting. Now, what does this bacteria really look like? Now, of course, we need to do the gram stem. Is that right? Lots of people do gram stem. What's going to be the gram results looks like? It is gram negative rods, and it is coco bacillus. Very typical, very tricky. What it means, coco bacillus? Looks like a coccyl, looks like a rods. Somewhere between it, we gave them a name called a coccobacillus. So that's very typical and a very interesting bacteria. Cause number one childhood disease in the United States is hemophilus influenza. So we can see right here, it's curing three million worldwide, long time ago. And I'll tell you one thing, it's very interesting. When the people first find this hemophilus influenza, they think it's called uh, ammonia. It's the symptoms looks like influenza. That's why the species name is influenza, but it actually is much more severe disease than ammonia, than influenza. And for the child, when they first come in, they find the esophagus, the softest bone, is like something like a broken or didn't work. They will be confused with another bacteria called parohemophilus influenza. That parohemophilus influenza is a much milder symptom because it's only need X or V it can grow. So when they diagnose that isolated this, there's a lots of story happens at the beginning. Then later on people find it's hemophilus influenza. And then luckily we have a vaccine, it's HIB vaccine. What means B is type B? Because type of B hemophilus influenza, that's a target pathogen causing meningitis. We can go back to look at what, the, what is the um, immune um, schedule. Same thing, two months, four months, six months, 12 to 18 months, then that's enough for the hemophilus influenza type of B. Okay? Um, here we want to mention is that you have a lethargy, confusion, stiffness of the neck, and maybe phyto and vomiting headache, of course you have it. Now, by the way, I forgot to mention what's going to be the diphtheria symptoms. The diphtheria symptoms usually we will have is a double vision. And then you're going to have a difficult speak and difficult swearing. Uh, Swarming, sorry. When you're eating, you're feeling it's difficult. Okay, that's for the symptoms, some of the symptoms for the diphtheria when the adult people have. So we go back to here. This is a hemophilus influenza. You see, it grew really well on the chocolate agar. This is what chocolate agar looks like, brownish color. Single colony right there, representing a pure culture. This is on the Neutron broth, you do, do need X and V factor. And X is hemming, V is NAD, you see, grow really well. Only have X and V, it's not going to grow. This is a very typical phenomenon, we call it a satellite phenomenon. We grow a blood agar, a red one. Then Staphylococcus aureus growing there. Then if you cultivate hemophilus influenza, of course, type B, you will see it's surrounded their very tiny colony. This is called a satellite phenomenon, okay? Next one, Neisseria meningitis. We want to mention this guy. Neisseria meningitis, since it's talk about Neisseria, there is another pathogen, the same genome, which is Neisseria gonorrhea, we will mention later on, because that's a tr sexual transmitted disease. Uh, we'll mention later on, now, Neisseria meningitis. Very interesting. This bacteria is gram-negative, large shape. What's the arrangement? 
coffee bean. It is also diprococcal, diprococcobacillus, coffee bean shape. That's why these three items are important. If you see its gram-negative loss, cocobacillus, hemophilus influenza based on the age. If you are undergraduates, like well, some of you, if you have a tough neck, then go into the, see a doctor, have a couple of days not really good, then through the cerebral spinal fluid, the back, you get those liquid. If you find the gram stem is gram-negative loss and the coffee bean shape, it is Neisseria meningitis. Neisseria meningitis just looks like that. You see it, coffee bean shape, and it's surrounded by the white blood cell. Very interesting, in the United States, the major string serotype <coughs> is A, B, C, Y, and W135. Here is a story about, about it. Because the target risk group is undergraduates in the, in the university, so there is a vaccine before 2012 which is called a monumine, a vaccine called. Called a monumine. This vaccine will cover A, C, Y, and 135. However, in the United States, the B type of B is responsible for 60% of the case. The others is only for 40%. So there is a big debate in the history whether the undergraduate is required to have this monument vaccine to control Neisseria meningitis. The story is there is a, in the 1990s, there is an undergraduate's name is Ryan, uh, I forgot the first uh, last name. He's a student in uh, Indiana University at Bloomington. It's not too far away from here. He's a, a biology student. Uh, one day he was uh, doing a study, he feeling not very good, have a tough neck, have those uh, uh, drowsy or not very much energy, so he go to sleep. Then the second day he's going to still eat something, still not feeling very well, go to sleep again. Then he sleep again to the third day. Until the fourth day, then the roommate find he's not really good, then go to see a doctor. Then the doctor going through the cerebral spinal fluid to find this Neisseria meningitis. At that time, he's only said it's a Neisseria caused meningitis. They find that it's already at the latest stage, and they use antibiotics immediately, and luckily he survived. And later on, he was doing some of the charity stuff for the research part, and some other things to establish a foundation to help the people in the... A college who had the same as the meningitis. Uh, so because of that big story, some of the states, like Connecticut in California, they require the students to have the monument to do the vaccination, but there is a big debate because the type of B is the number one in the United States. Even if you have a vaccine, you're only going to cover like 40%. So there's a big debate by the time, but after 2012, one of that is type of B uh, capsule, same thing as the hemophilus influenza. The scientists do the extraction and the purification. They find that they developed a new vaccine. The new vaccine is target for the type of B. So later on, you need to have a monumine, and you also had a APSV, MPSV4, and MCV4. You need to do two combination of the vaccination and well cover this bacteria. Okay, but I don't think in here we're going to care about that too much. But uh, history, Neisseria meningitis is a big story. Because the target is undergraduates in the college, college students. So lots of the story are, 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 are behind that. And I can send you that story um, on the, in the website, and, and in all, or I post it on the eCampus, and you can read about it. Bird terrier pertussis, the last one. We will talk about this one really briefly. Bird terror pertussis. Bird terror pertussis, first of all, it's, we mentioned, it's covered by this vaccine. This P is bird terror pertussis. So one shot, three jobs. If the people do not have the vaccine, what are they going to cause? 
This is usually is a hundred day old kids. Will has a whooping will has a whooping cough. So in some of the country in China, we also call it a hundred day cough. Now the question is, what is a whooping cough? What is whooping cough? Whooping cough, which means a very productive cough with loud, a voice is really loud, respiratory gasp. So it looks like you cough, 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 then whoo, then cough, 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 whoo, like that. That's called a whooping cough. And typically, for budgetary purposes, for the kids, 100 days. Same thing, this is an AB toxin. This toxin is also AB toxin, very similar to the Neisseria meningitis. Oh, for, sorry, for the colobacter dipseria, A domain, B domain. That's why, because it's similar, that's why this this vaccine could be covered those three. There's something is inter interesting or something or similar. There stops protein synthesis, the same thing. Destroy epithelial tissue. The key story is here. How we do the nasal for gel swab identification. This is very interesting. The diagnosis is, is, in, is interesting. People develop this very interesting method. So, if you ever be people like this, how do they do it? It's a Dacron swab. It's not a general cotton swab, it's a Dacron swab. So Dacron swab needs to be touched into the nose. Of course it's a nasal for gel swab. But then how deep it is? You gonna have to measure the distance between the earlobe and the nose. How deep it is, the depth 